As you know, whack-a-mole games have little characters that pop up out of holes at random and the game is to bop them with some kind of mallet while they're exposed. I thought I'd try to make one, <laughs> but in a more vintage style, as if the Victorians had invented them. But in fact, they were invented in 1975 in Japan, apparently. But how do they work? Well, I don't know, actually. I couldn't find any plans for them, and there aren't any near me that I could go and visit. But perhaps that doesn't matter. Perhaps I can work out something myself that does the job. And the very first question to answer is how to make the little characters pop up. Apparently, the big heavy arcade machines used compressed air somehow to propel the characters out of their holes. So I found a table tennis ball and a suitably sized tube and tried that out. <laughs> Perfect. Except I decided that wasn't going to be very practical for my game because I'd need to carry a bottle of compressed air to the market or else a compressor and a generator and that's not going to happen. But it was fun anyway. And it's an idea that might come around again. Who knows? But in the meantime... I looked for alternatives and uh, specifically electromagnets or solenoid switches. They could work. They'd need a 12 volt supply, but a car battery would do that for me, wouldn't it? But when I tried out two different small electromagnets, I soon found that they don't like being left on for more than a second or two. Otherwise, these ones at least start warming up ominously. Now a second or two might be long enough to have the character popped up. I don't really know. Lots of experimentation needed for that. How long does it take someone to see and react to a popped up target? You don't want to make it too easy for them but not too difficult either. So I'm going to need some way to adjust the timing of everything afterwards. The other problem with using these things is how to activate them in the first place. How to send a pulse of power to the electromagnet and then switch it off again a short time later. I know that electronics can do that, but that's all a bit Greek to me. So I looked for a more mechanical way of switching and I came up with this. <laughs> now don't laugh. It's a slow turning copper disc. And the idea is that I could use insulation tape on the disc to switch on and off the power. So to set this up, I had to draw and print uh, a motor holder and pulleys and a gantry to hold little carbon brushes, which are the contacts. Obviously, the copper plate conducts the electricity needed to activate the electromagnet, or in this case, to light the lamp. So if I feed power onto the disc using a carbon brush, the sort that you'd find in any small motor, and then off the disc again using a different carbon brush, then you can make a circuit which can be opened and closed as pieces of insulation tape move around under the brushes. You could have lots and lots of tiny pieces or long pieces depending on when you want to open and close the circuit. So an electromechanical rotating switching disc. So there. <laughs> now, there would be room for lots of circuits on this gantry. And actually it all was very interesting but ultimately not precise enough. And even a small amount of dust is enough to break the contact and I think the contacts probably need to be um, have more pressure on them to ensure a good connection but you know then they might slag on the tape so in the end this experiment turned out to be a bit of a cul-de-sac but I do like the principle of this mechanism so I suspect I'll try and use it again sometime somewhere but not for this pop-up challenge 
So then I started on another way altogether, mechanically pushing up levers using little bumps on a moving belt. I was going to use a wide belt, but getting that to move consistently might prove tricky. You know, it might bunch up on the side or something. So I tried a V belt with the idea of having a few belts side by side and the bumps could be spaced randomly along the belt. The bumps can only be fixed in one place so that it's still flexible enough to go around the pulleys, but I made little rails on the underside to stop them twisting sideways. I can decide how long the character stays up in the air by the length of the bump. And I can have as many bumps as I like on a belt and theoretically as many belts as I like too. Now that might work, maybe even though the arc made by the lever means that the character wouldn't jump exactly vertically, would it? Not quite, but you know, it's good enough, I think. These characters have to be robust enough to be able to withstand repeated boppings, as does the lever and the bump. But I think, well, it depends what kind of mallet people use, doesn't it? I keep saying character because I'm not actually going to make mine into moles to be whacked. For one thing, there aren't any moles in Ireland. They didn't make it over the land bridge in time at the end of the last ice age. But also, I have no wish to promote whacking animals of any kind, obviously. So I'm going to need a different um, name, different characters soon. But in the meantime, most people will know the name Whack-A-Mole. I guess. Have you any suggestions for a better name? Go on, let's be having them. Anyway, whatever the characters end up being called, perhaps this is a feasible way to pop them up into the air and then let them fall down again smartly. So finally, made a start. Now that one small belt isn't going to be good enough, is it? So I turned down some pipe on the old lathe to make a couple of axles in bearings so I could experiment with a longer belt and a larger frame. Whew, what a palaver, <laughs> just to try the experiment. And of course I have to then try to figure out how to drive it round and round. Remember, this might end up going down to the market square, so I won't be able to plug it in anywhere. So I'm using a 12 volt motor, so it could work with the car battery. This is an old windscreen wiper motor, which turns nice and slowly. The trouble with it was that there was no handy way to attach a pulley to it. All it had is a small round knurled bit that has to take all the torque. So I made an aluminium plate to fit on the CNC router. My first time milling aluminium on it. It worked fine. And then I used various drill bits to get the hole in the middle close to the right shape. And then I whacked it on, hoping that the knurling would bite into the soft metal. Now, <laughs> Obviously, in hindsight, I realised I shouldn't have whacked it on at all because now it makes a funny little noise and I guess it wasn't very good for the gearing inside, but it is still going. I was able to hold that plate on with a nut and then attach various size pulleys until I found one that gave me something like the right speed, except of course I don't know what the right speed is. I don't know how fast this thing should go around. The truth is I've only ever played whack-a-mole once in my life and that was 40 years ago in the States and I've never seen one since <laughs> so I don't know how long a round, how long a session should last and how often the little characters should pop up but of course it doesn't matter because I'm making my own version so I can make it any way I want to. 
as I say, originally the plan was to use some sort of wide webbing instead of multiple narrow belts. But this way I can mount the levers either side of each belt. So that's good, really. And I can reposition the belts if I want to, to change the pattern of the bumps. But look, here's another problem. The belts themselves are sort of wavy and uneven. They'd have to be very tight to avoid that. But those undulations in the belt might well activate the levers at the wrong time, or at least partially activate them, which wouldn't be any good. So I redesigned the lever mechanism to include some springs and a roller bearing. So now I can put much more downwards pressure on the belt to hold it down and still have the lever work. And that looked okay. And with the principle established, I bit the bullet and cut out lots more discs. Lots and lots of discs. Some with round holes and some with square holes. The square hole ones go onto a square shaft that the windscreen wiper motor drives around. And there are two smaller holes in each disc for six millimeter threaded bar. That's just to hold the whole stack together. And I needed three stacks. But now I have space for lots of V-belts. Anyway, while the V-belts were on order, I investigated the next challenge. You see, I'm thinking that if people pay a couple of euro to play this game, as I hope they will, they'll want some sort of counter that shows how many beasties they've bopped. So they can brag about it or challenge their friends or whatever. So I need some sort of counting mechanism. But how to operate such a counter? Hmm. I decided I needed to incorporate a switch into each lever. And any or all of those switches could activate one electromagnet. And that electromagnet could somehow work a counter. All right. Would that work? I don't really know. But I found these tiny limit switches and set one into the lever. So when the lever is depressed, the switch is actuated. So far, so good. But of course, you don't want it to switch when the lever pops up or when it falls down again. It has to only activate when the target is actually bopped. And the delicate switch, well, you know, you wouldn't be able to take the full force of an excited punter <laughs> with, a, with a mallet, however soft that mallet is. So I included a spring and hinges and four flexible bamboo arms. And after a lot of experimentation, I think that now there's enough give to cope with the bopping and enough sensitivity to activate the switch. Whew. Hope so. But of course, by now it's all becoming heavy and cumbersome even just to set it up to see if it was working at all. So I had to make some decisions about the final size of the frame and ultimately the size of the table that people would play on and how high it should be and how heavy it's likely to become and how I'm going to move it around. Would it go in the back of the car? Would it go up curbs and steps and things? Lots of unknowns. And you know what it's like when you have to make decisions before you have all the information that you need. You can only hope that you get it right. Or at least right enough. Same as everything in life, I suppose. And we'll find out soon enough. Okay, I've got to hold that bit down there. Oh, green light, good. And... <laughs> that bit's working. That's sort of working. Here, can't yeah, oh. there's enough of a pulse in there. Just with one. Even tiny. It's good then, isn't it? Yeah. But why is that? 
glowing all the time. I'd say it's because it's got a charge through the coil. So all this time data, I finally have a mechanism that might be the basis of the final machine. Now I'm held up waiting for more parts, but at least the belts arrived. Of course now I expect you to tell me what I've done wrong and what I should have done instead. And that's fine. There's still time to change things if you really have a better idea. And I'd like to hear your ideas anyway. And if you have access to a real whack-a-mole game, one of these, perhaps you could tell me please how long the characters stay popped up and how long the whole session lasts. I might have to speed up or slow down the motor. At the moment it, um, it cycles in about 40 seconds. That doesn't sound like a lot, does it? Hmm. But you can fit dozens of pop-ups into that time. I'm actually really enjoying this project and all its little challenges and I'm thinking of other similar projects at the same time of course. So I hope you'll join me for the next thrilling episode and in the meantime don't forget the name. I need a new name. Okay.